Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. The slaves, once they arrived, their families were split up, their freedom was split up, their culture was taken away from them. The only thing they had left was religion, and they didn't want to give that up. They were all baptized Roman Catholics, but the slaves did a very clever thing. They hung onto their tradition by, in secret, praying to the deities from Africa, but Every once in a while, a priest would come in and they would immediately shift into the Catholic deity that most closely resembled the deity in Africa. Now, it's intriguing to me that you said Catholic deity. I think you meant Catholic saint. Uh, but the point... Yes, Catholic saint. The, the, right. the, it's an interesting point because the, with all of their saints and the ways in which Catholics uh, implore uh, their saints for help, it's not so different from a polytheistic religion. Not so different. This is what they found out. For example, in Africa, Iamanja, the goddess of the salt water, was a fairly minor deity. But that's the one that they prayed to, to protect them coming across the Atlantic Ocean. And so when the priests came in and they were thanking Iamanja for their safe visit, they immediately shifted to, Hail Mary, full of grace, blessed be the fruit of thy womb, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the priests, oh, what good Catholics they've turned out to be. The astonishing thing is they got away with this. Mm -hmm. they For got centuries. A, yeah, they gave white masks to the dark faces. Mm -hmm. And once the slaves were freed, by the way, by a princess from Portugal, once Napoleon took over Portugal, the royalty came to Brazil, once the slaves were freed in about 1880-something, then Candomblé came to, to its own, spread all around the country, not only under the name of Candomblé, other names as well. Mm -hmm. And interestingly enough, it was the women who were in charge of many of the terreros or churches or worship centers, the main one being the White House, the Casa Branca in Salvador, Brazil. Mm -hmm. And I had the great privilege, as did you, of visiting my Menonide de Guantua, who was a direct descendant of the founders of that particular church, which was the first major candomblé uh, center of worship in Brazil once the slaves are freed. In Salvador, where, which is sort of the center of candomblé culture. Salvador is the center of, uh, that's right, absolutely mm -hmm. right. Now you mentioned that candomblé is known by many names, yes. and, and we've also talked about Umbanda. So uh, can you distinguish between candomblé and Umbanda? Yes, once candomblé became above board and people practiced it, a lot of middle-class people were attracted to candomblé, but they were a little bit too refined for all of the drumming and even the animal sacrifice, now not so common, and they wanted something, you know, a little bit more sophisticated. So in about the year 1900, they formed an offshoot of candomblé called Umbanda. And that leaned a little more heavily on the uh, Christian saints. Mm -hmm. And interestingly enough, they're so similar that I have a friend, Pai A. Lee, in Recife, Brazil, who is a priest both of Candomblé and of Umbanda, and his temple, which attracts hundreds of people and has a congregation of thousands of people, some nights he has an Umbanda service, some nights he has a Candomblé service. And across the walls, there are statues of the African deities and on another wall of the Christian saints. Mm -hmm. And he bounces back and forth between the two as the occasion permits. Mm 